Hi there. Good afternoon. Let's talk about multiplication. So last time, this is where we left it. And I teased you. Um, it seems like some people may have been genuinely teased by my question, which means that I answered it, asked it well, which is just asking, is n squared the best we can do for multiplication or not? And if we think about this, it seems like the answer is yes. It seems like the answer is n squared is the best we can do. Because you know the definition of multiplication. If we multiply two numbers like 6, 8, 7, 1, 5 times um, 1, 2, 6, 3, 4, you're saying, like, I have to multiply each digit in this first number times each digit in this second number. That's just what multiplication is. And what you're saying, if, if you want to make that argument, what you're really saying is that I know this way to multiply numbers, and there must not be any other way to do it. And when I put it like that, of course, you can see that that's a, that's a ridiculous, that's not a, that's not a valid way of arguing. But it's very easy to fall into this trap because it's, it's easy for us to get mixed up between a problem and an algorithm. Remember, we talked about this right from the beginning of class. The problem is what thing are we solving? Just defined by the input and what's the correct answers. And the algorithm is the process you go about computing that. Right? If you had only ever seen selection sort and insertion sort, you might think, well, in order to sort, I kind of have to compare every number in the array to every other number in the array. And since there's like big O of n squared pairs of numbers in the array, I have to do n squared work in order to sort a list. That would make sense. That sounds plausible. But where does that argumentation break down is the same place that the argumentation breaks down here, is that you're not allowed to say, I have to multiply every digit times every other digit. You don't have to do that. Maybe that's the only way that you know how to do that. Maybe that's even the only way anybody knows how to do that. But that doesn't mean that that's the only way that it's necessarily possible to solve the problem. The only way that we can argue about lower bounds is by speaking more generally about what any algorithm would have to do. And in this case, as it turns out, and we're going to see today, there are faster ways to do multiplication that don't require um, doing a quadratic amount of work. So let's see how it is. Um, the very first algorithm to do this, uh, it was invented in like the late 50s, late um, 1950s, by this uh, Russian researcher named uh, Karatsuba. And there's some interesting stories about uh, this guy, and, and it's, but it's, it's very related to his name. He was part of a research group um, in Moscow, and the publication actually also has another um, author's name on it, uh, Ofman, but apparently that was just like the head of the research lab that didn't actually contribute anything to doing it. I know this because um, this researcher, Karatsuba's daughter, is very aggressive about making sure that people refer to his algorithm as Karatsuba's algorithm only, not Karatsuba and Offman. Um, and I happen to have a paper that uh, referred to Karatsuba's algorithm, so I, I know that from firsthand experience. So interesting characters. Um, but it's, it's also a good example of where we didn't know, by we I mean like the Western world, sorry, didn't know even about this result for a number of years because it was published in Russian. And then you had to, at that time, there was like kind of these parallel trend uh, research works going on in different parts of the world. And you had to wait until like the English journal translation version of some result would come out until the rest of the world might have known about it. Um, so it's, uh, there was a little bit of a delay there. But definitely until this time, everybody thought the same as what you maybe thought a couple minutes ago, which is that multiplication inherently requires quadratic amount of time. And Karatsuba was the first to prove that it's not a requirement and you can do it faster. And it's, it's about this formulation. So this is a little bit of a hairy looking equation. Let's try to break this down. There's three terms here. So this is the term with b to the zero, which, you know, times one, which is b to the zero. Here's the term times b to the two m. Those two are exactly the same as what well, we had before right here. So x0, y0, and x1, y1, b to the 2m. 
So that's the same two terms that come out of FOIL. Now the difference is in this middle term. So before, we looked at a divide and conquer approach for multiplication before, it didn't work out. And what was the issue is that we had to do four products of half the size. And so here it's x0 times y1 and x1 times y0. And so the innovation from Karatsuba is that you can compute those middle sums without having to do two more products. So this whole middle part right here, that's actually the key innovation. And mathematically, why does it work out is because what we had before was x0, uh, y1 plus x1, y0. And you can see that that is equal to this product, x0 plus x1 times y0 plus y1 minus that x0, y0 minus x1, y1. And if, so if you FOIL this out, you'll get x0, y0 minus x0 minus y0. So that cancels out x1, y1 minus x1, y1. So that cancels out. And what you have left over is just these two terms. But this is like a bigger formula. So why is computing this formula better than just computing these two terms? It's because it's all about the multiplications. Check it out. What this formula allows us to do is we get to reuse um, products that we've already computed. So x0 times y0, this is already computed because that's already the first part of what FOIL gives us. So we get to reuse that one twice. And same with x1, y1. That appears over here, but it also appears over here. We already computed that. So even though this formula over here looks bigger, it's actually only one more multiplication besides these two we have to do for the top and the bottom of the product. So the orange things are about some reuse which we didn't get in the previous formula. And so what that all comes down to is that you only have to do three products, x0, y0, x1, y1, and this sum times that sum. So three products instead of four, and that's gonna turn out to make um, all the difference. So before we get into the analysis of this, let's work through a short example. Don't worry, you'll have more time to work through examples. Um, and this will give us a little bit of a feel of how the algorithm works. So here's uh, two numbers I want to multiply, 7407 times 2915. And so we can first break them up. So this is a divide and conquer algorithm still. It's just a smart divide and conquer algorithm that um, is a little bit smarter than the previous divide and conquer algorithm we looked at. Okay, so it's going to break up these numbers according to their digits. So 7 is like 0, 7, right? So that's the low order terms and the high order ones over here. So that's good. So 7 is x0 um, and 74 is x1. And then we compute these two sums. So x0 plus x1 and y0 plus y1. So that's like adding up the two halves of each number. So there's like 74 plus 7 and 29 plus 15. So we get two more two-digit numbers out of that. And now we have to do three products. These are where the recursive call works. In this case, we started with four-digit numbers, so we're going to have recursive calls on two-digit numbers. Um, so those are now just help, dealt with with recursion. In reality, we would start with big numbers, then break them down to half the size, then break those down to half their size, and then build it back up. Uh, but here, we're just going to look one level down in the recursion. And then we have to combine everything back together. So these are the three results of the recursive calls, 105, 2146, and 3564. And what I want you to notice is that when we're adding all this up, so this is kind of like looking at it linearly. This is looking at it um, stacked up what we see is uh, this term here is reusing the 105 and reusing the 2146. So it's like you have to do a little bit of extra addition at the beginning and a little bit of extra subtraction at the end 
in order to reduce the number of multiplications. So we, in, in particular, we save one recursive multiplication. And so another way of thinking about what Karatsuba's algorithm is about is like, okay, it's this different mathematical formulation. It definitely works out. So you can, you can see these numbers, 105. The reason why they're, they're done like this is because they're multiplied with powers of the base. So that really just means shifting. So this number here comes out to 1313. And so when you add those three up properly shifted, you get the right answer. And you can confirm that this is the actual product of 7407 times 2915. And so what Karatsuva's algorithm is doing is kind of a trade-off. It's saying, okay, we're gonna do a little bit more work at each step in terms of additions and subtractions in order to save work in terms of multiplications. And that turns out to be a big bonus because additions and subtractions are fast, right? Additions and subtractions are like linear time, but multiplications are slow. They're not actually gonna be quadratic time anymore, but you can think of them as being slower, more than linear time. And so if we can trade off of doing more additions and subtractions so that we do fewer multiplications, that's gonna be a big win. Um, and so let's, let's look at this analysis. Here's what the recurrence looks like. Um, in general, it's n plus three times t of n over two. What's the difference from this from the previous one? I'll give you a second to see if you can notice it. Yes, so the difference from the previous recurrence that we saw is just this three. It's the coefficient um, of t of n over two, because that's the number of recursive calls. The n part didn't change. Maybe really it's like two n now instead of n that it was before, or it's three n instead of n, but it's, it's gonna be a big theta of n because this is the addition of subtractions all cost big O of n time, and they're not recursive. The thing that really kills you, and remember this, whenever we're thinking about recursive algorithms, we've seen this a number of examples in the class, um, the number of recursive calls is really what kills the performance. Think back to like one of the early puzzle problems we did about computing the max and I gave a bad algorithm to compute the max that accidentally had two recursive calls. And if you remember, that algorithm ended up being exponential time just because of doing two recursive calls instead of one. So changing the number of recursive calls can have a big effect on the runtime of an algorithm. Um, and so that's what makes a difference here for Karatsuba. And so now let's see um, how we can think about analyzing this one. Analyzing this recurrence is not going to be as easy as it was before, but uh, we can definitely do it. And before we even get started, we know that it should be between um, like n log n, because that's what it would be if this was 2, like for merge sort. And so I'll write that as a omega. We know it has to be at least n log n, and we know it's going to be at most n squared because that's what it was when this coefficient was four, like for the normal bad uh, divide and conquer multiplication. Okay, so let's, let's do this analysis. We have t of n is n plus three times t of n over two. So let's expand this out. n plus three, and then we're gonna substitute n over two everywhere here. So we're gonna get three over two times n plus um, three times another three, so nine t of n over four. Okay, and if you expand out the next level, three over two n plus, and then if you substitute n over four everywhere here and plug it in for t of n over four, you'll get nine times n over four, so that's nine over four times n, plus, 9 times 3 times t of n over 8. So 27 times t of n over 8. And so now this, this summation is not quite as easy as it was before. It's not exactly one that we've seen, but we can hopefully see the pattern is that we're starting with n, then 3 over 2, then 9 over 4. The next one would be 27 over 8. So it's like a power of 3 divided by a power of 2. Um, so that's what these things turn out to be. And this term turns out to be the one that really matters. Um, 
because this is growing faster than than either of these. What you should notice is that each of these is like a multiple larger than the previous step, which means it's going to be dominated by um, this trailing term. So this is like 3 to the k or 3 to the i times t of n over 2 to the i. And so now if you think about this, how far do we have to do to reach the base case? We need this to come down to 1. So we will hit the base case when um, i is something like log base 2 of n. And so now we can substitute that in. That'll give us 3 to the log base 2 of n times 1, times t of 1. OK, so now what's 3 to the log base 2 of n? Well, there's, a, there's a, another property of logs. You could, you could work this out from the properties of logs that you already know. But whenever we have something to the log of something, you can always swap the base and uh, the, the thing that is being logged in the exponent. Um, you can swap those two values, in it, and it doesn't change what the, um, what the overall value is. So I can swap the n and the 3 here. And this comes out to be exactly equal to n to the log base 2 of 3. And why is that nice? Is because log base 2 of 3 is just a number. And if we compute that out, we'll see that it's like 1.58 something. So this is um, about n to the 1.59. Really, we'll, we'll usually write n to the log base 2 of 3 because this is the most accurate way of writing that um, since the exponent is not a whole number. But it's something between n log n and n squared, right? It's less than n squared because 1.59 is less than 2. And it's something more than n log n because 1.59 is bigger than 1. But this is what the uh, runtime complexity, this is what the big theta is going to be big theta of n to the log base 2 of 3. Now, I ignored these other terms in the summation and just focused on the last one because, like I said, the summation terms are each getting exponentially bigger. So that means that the total sum is going to be dominated by this last term. Um, and soon we'll see a, a different tool that we can use to kind of take a shortcut in that. And uh, just to give you an idea, um, we'll talk about more about this in class. So that's, that's Karatsuba's algorithm. It's the first one that ever became faster than n squared. And it was not the last algorithm to be faster than n squared. So in fact, there's a long history of people studying this problem. Um, you can see this paper showed up in 1962 in English. Uh, so that n to the 1.59 algorithm. Toome and Cook, so this is a Canadian researcher, uh, Cook, uh, figured out how to split in three ways and do a bunch of crazier combinations and you, you get to shrink that exponent down a little bit to n to the 1.47. And then the series of results over the last like 40 or 50 years, these are all based on um, the fast Fourier transform or the FFT. If you don't know what that is, that's okay, but you might have seen that in some engineering classes. And they kind of break it down to doing a, another multiplication on smaller numbers, but then you have to, uh, it's kind of like splitting up the digits in different bases. And then you have to multiply the digits underneath that base. And that's where you get this recursion. So you can imagine like you start with a huge number, then you're going to break it down into really big digits with a pretty big base. And then in such a way that the base is carefully chosen so that that multiplication works quickly. But now you have to do the operations underneath that base. So then you do that recursively and then you do that recursively down. So that's when you get these like log log and stuff like that. And it's very, it's such recent work that in 2019, um, these two researchers, David Harvey, who's um, in Australia and Joris van der Hoeven, um, who's uh, in France, they finally, came down, this was a long sought after goal to get an n log n algorithm to do um, integer multiplication. It's very complicated, totally impractical. The Karatsuba algorithm actually gets used in practice for like things like RSA primes. The Schoenhage and Strassen algorithm here does get used sometimes for even larger numbers, 
but these other ones like due to Martin Fuhrer and uh, David Harvey and, and yours, um, they don't they don't ever get used in practice, but it's a theoretical result that kind of matches that uh, long slot after goal of doing uh, integer multiplication at the same same time as sorting. And I'll just point out that um, we we don't even know if this is the best possible. So unlike with sorting, where we know we have a proof that any sorting algorithm would cost n log n time, we don't have a similar proof or a lower bound for integer multiplication. So many people believe that this result just from 2019 is the best possible um, complexity for integer multiplication of n log n, but we don't actually know. Maybe it's possible to do um, big theta of n time. The only lower bound we have is really that the uh, is n the size of the, um, the the linear time lower bound. Um, so that's that. We we only looked at Karatsuba. It's a divide and conquer algorithm. Um, but I, I wanted to give you a little bit of the history of how this has progressed since then to give you an idea of um, that researchers are really working on these algorithmic ideas a lot. For things like sorting, we've understood for many, many decades, like what's the asymptotically optimal algorithm. But for a lot of other problems, even this basic problem of integer multiplication, there's like ongoing exciting work even up to like our present era, which is exciting for you because it means that these are things that you could work on too. Um, if you wanted to pursue some research projects or go into grad school or that kind of thing. Okay, great. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll talk to you more next time.